Okay, so in this instructional video, we're going to take a look at a sample race, and I'm going to try and pull out a few observations as I go along to try and uh, help uh, explain my thought processes. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the, the race course. Um, what you're seeing here is a plan view of Chew Valley Lake, and the race was in the northern part, the top part of, uh, of the lake, with a start line, which is two, two transits from the shore, going out to an inner distance mark and an outer distance mark, that's the blue line with the start line written by it, going up to mark one, so it's a beat up to the first mark, uh, and then a more of a sort of a, a very broad reach down to the second mark, and then a tighter reach across to mark three, with another beat back up uh, through the gate, and up to mark one. The wind shifting around a little bit, at times it's northerly, at other times it's north northeast, other times it's north northwest. Let's take a quick look at some of the strategic factors in, in this wind direction. So I've overlaid um, in, in black the areas of the lake that um, racers aren't permitted to sail in. I've put areas in red that uh, are areas where there's likely to be less pressure as a result of, uh, of the sort of topography of the land causing wind shadow effects. And, uh, and finally the sort of blue area which is where the main channel of wind seems to funnel from this particular direction. So it's an area that's pretty good to stay in if we can. It's probably worth also noting that in the northerly direction, and certainly in the north-northwest direction, the port end of the start line is favoured. We're going to move to some video footage now. And before we do, just a quick thanks to those who ran the race on the day, those who kept us safe on the day, and of course to my fellow racers who made it so much fun on the day. In the background audio, you should be able to hear me counting down the time for a fellow sailor that missed the, uh, the, the warning signal. Um, and that in itself sets out the importance of getting accurate timing for the start. In this sample race, the port end of the line is quite biased. And with a minute to go, I'm around about midline. Um, so I know I've got, to, uh, I've got to get my way, make my way down to the port end pretty quickly. Now I'm on, this, I'm on the lay line. For the, uh, for the the port end here, um, which is a good place to be, a sensible place to be, and uh, and I'm working pretty hard now to get down there in, in time. Having got to myself to a position where I feel comfortable that I'm going to be able to make the port end of the line, I then look to control my speed, um, whilst retaining enough speed to be able to, to make manoeuvres, uh, I'm looking to control my speed such that I can make uh, a start at the, uh, at the port end. At the same time, out of shot of this picture, somebody else has uh, tacked in from, from a port tack position and has pinched the favoured spot at the port end. It's going to make it difficult for me. And I've taken the judgement with only a couple of seconds to go that I can get over the top of this port tacker and, uh, and cross the line. Unfortunately, my judgement is out by a split second and I'm so close to the race officer, I'm always going to be called over the line. Despite the OCS, being at the favoured end of the line on such a biased line means that you know, with a positive recovery and a good piece of boat handling, sometimes you can get back in the race straight away and even cross in front of boats that started further down the line more towards the starboard end. Now that I'm sailing in the right direction again, um, you can see that I'm just adjusting a few sail controls to try to get the balance of power uh, in the rig correct for these, these conditions and hopefully you can see the boat is flat in terms of its uh, trim and if anything there's a, ever so slight windward heel. As I just nip across the, the bows of these starboard tackers you should notice uh, pressure arriving and pressure arriving again around about now. Notice the, uh, the, the dropping of the sheet followed by the pulling on of the kicking strap as I now adjust to an increased amount of pressure also notice that the boat doesn't really heal at any of this at this time particularly. If it does, I'm trying to respond very fast. Having got through the first 100 yards or so, in club racing it's entirely possible that you're not that far from the windward mark now, but certainly even in, in, in any sort of, sort of racing after 100 yards, you need to ensure that you've got more of a broad focus um, and you can be looking, you're looking at where you're going, thinking about where you wanted to go, where you are with respect to the windward mark, are you downwind of it, are you near the rum line or are you out to one side or the other, 
it's important to now be thinking strategically and uh, getting your head out of the boat. Coming up now, you're going to see a great example of uh, somebody who thinks they understand upwind strategy, and, and that's me failing to apply it themselves. So in this situation, I'm currently uh, I've just been tacked on by the race leader. Um, at the moment, I've been you know, gaining places and I'm going in the direction I wish to go. Um, but I've just been tacked on and I've got to make a decision. So just to remind you, all this, uh, looking at the plan view, I'm currently on port tack and I'm just heading into that sort of wind channel, the blue channel. Um, I want to keep going and stay in that channel if I can. But I've just been tacked on and my options are, do I just hang on in there, maybe lose a little bit of, little bit of speed as I'm in some dirty air? Do I uh, foot off below that guy and carry on going right? Or do I do I sort of respond to being tacked on and let myself be controlled by tacking off onto starboard and heading out of that wind band and back towards the shore? So uh, let's take a look at what I do. And you've probably guessed already that I'm going to put a tack in. Let's take a look. During the tack, it's important to have a narrow focus, concentrating on getting through the tack smoothly and getting the boat back up to speed. But once you have, it's important to return to a broad focus, getting your head out of the boat, looking at where, you're, where you want to go next, where you are with respect to the windward mark. Now, up until around about now, I've actually been making gains over the boats around, and you're going to see in a minute um, that I've made a gain over the green boat and its partner that had just crossed my stern a minute ago. Unfortunately, the decision to tack there has taken me in into shore and there's actually going to be less breeze there um, and that's because the breeze is going to be trying to lift up over the top of the trees. That's a bad strategic mistake by me. So the decision to move out of the main channel of wind um, is going to cost me quite dear. Um, so the cover and tack put in by the lead boat was very effective at taking me somewhere I didn't want to go. And you've probably spotted me tweaking with the kicker, and that's because you'll also note that the sheet is block to block. Um, there's less pressure here, and uh, I'm going considerably less fast than the boats that are out in the main channel of wind. And uh, I had a good lead over the green laser, and I had a good lead over Keith um, in his laser. And you'll note as we as I now have to tack again, because I'm not going to quite make the, uh, the window mark. So I'm going to have to put another double tack in. It's going to take me more time. And if you watch this through, you'll notice that the green laser, which is Phil, um, is going to have made a very large gain on me, and Keith. Uh, has also made a very, very significant gain. And I'm fortunate that he doesn't force me to tack. He's got enough room to get around the mark. OK, so I'm going to stop it there, because now is a critical time in the race. We've gone around the room with mark. We've borne a way to go downwind. It's really important that, ideally, before we've got to the room with mark, if we can, we're thinking about strategy for the downwind leg. So let's take a look at a plan view of the course. We've just gone around the windward mark. We're heading to the second mark, which is a fairly, fairly broad leg. Uh, it's a, a sort of broad reach, sort of uh, very, very broad reach. Now on this map, the red zones indicate the areas where there's less breeze due to, due to wind shadows or other effects. And the blue band represents probably where the, the stronger wind is funneling. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is put three routes, a high, a medium, and a low. Um, the first one is a, is a go high option, and this is a very classical option for those of us who are trying to defend our, our clean air from those trying to attack from behind. So the sailors that are behind quite often try and pinch our wind by sailing over the top. That leads to us sailing higher to defend our, our clear air, and so on and so on. The trouble with it is, of course, we end up sailing um, a much longer distance than we would otherwise have to. And in this particular case, it also leads us to sailing into um, the lee of an island, which means there's less pressure. And also, of course, we come in very slow on a dead run to the mark at the end. And that uh, makes us vulnerable to the people who have sailed this course, who have gone um, straight to the mark, and who would have inside rights on this starboard rounding. So this is the Following the rum line to the mark, it's the shortest route, 
and uh, if you've got nobody behind you um, or there's you know there's a good gap between yourself and those behind you it's a good option and finally this is a go low option this is a quite a nice option in that it allows us to stay in the sort of wind channel for as long as possible um, it may allow us actually to break away from the boats that have sailed high as well uh, if we're in a pack and also we come into the mark nice and quickly and we have got rights at the mark. Okay, so here we go, fascinating situation. I've got Keith to leeward of me, he's in a good position. I've got three boats just rounded behind me. They're gonna be able to put a form a very effective wind shadow um, to any boat that, like in my situation, that's to leeward of them. Uh, any pressure that comes down the lake, they're going to get first. So they're in a very good position to pinch my wind and sail straight over the top of me and put me to the back of the pack. I've also got a lead boat that's probably 15 or more seconds ahead going around that windward mark. He's got a really good lead and I know that if I try to defend my air by sailing high um, then all I'm going to do is take the fleet with me and that guy who was 15 seconds ahead is going to be 30 or more seconds ahead of the mark and we can, uh, I can kiss goodbye to any chance of winning this race. So I don't want to go high because that's not in my interest in terms of catching the guy up front. Um, it's just going to make us all sail a long course and we're going to end up in the lee of the island. Equally, I don't really think I can sail the rum line because these guys right behind me, if I sail the rum line, will just, well, more than likely, just keep me in their, in their dirty air and they'll sail straight over the top of me. So my option, my best option, it would appear at this stage, is to try, if I can, to break very low to sail really, really low. Um, it, when I get a patch of pressure, go low with it and try to break clear of the boats behind me that their natural inclination is to sail fairly high in this situation because they're trying to protect themselves from the guy behind. So if they're sailing a little higher and I'm sailing a lot lower, I may get sort of five or six boat lengths um, sort of to leeward of them and in which case I should be clear of their dirty air. So let's see how this one pans out um, over the next minute or so. It's interesting to see what Keith does. Now the guys behind me know, you know that I, I tend to sell relatively well at the club, so it's fascinating to watch what they do as they see how I'm, how I'm sailing. Look at the angle of the boat most to windward. He's sailing high, the guy in the middle is sort of sailing perhaps the rum line, and the guy to the left, who is Jeremy, is already starting to sail lower, and as you'll see, he's about to sail even lower. So, uh, interesting to see what they're up to. And if you just keep watching, you'll spot that Jeremy starts to go very low, just like myself, and the other two have broken higher. And we've got a great example here um, by, by Keith of using Solon Sternway to. Um, to make good progress downwind and Keith is really making good use of my stern wave surfing up underneath my boom there great uh, great technique uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for him as you just see there for him to stay on that stern wave um, but he will have another go in a minute and you can see if he can get on another of my stern waves which I think he will and you'll see him again surf up underneath my uh, my lured side really good technique from, from Keith and if you could have carried on doing that um, you may well have gone on to have had a, a spectacularly good downwind leg but under a little bit of pressure, um, Keith opts to sort of start heading up a little bit more towards the mark while I continue to go low. Um, and that's a decision that's going to largely govern the result of this downwind leg. Now, as I say, I'm sailing fairly low, so it's quite, it's quite, you know, very much at a run for me. And you can watch, hopefully you can see is that the inclination of the boat there, as I try to use any pressure I get, I use the sheet, just did it again there, easing the sheet to just try to make the boat death roll to some extent to try to encourage the boat to roll naturally uh, to windward and that helps me to bear away without having to use the rudder. You know, so I'm really sailing low here and you can just see Keith there he just <laughs> barely through the kicker. So he's now sailing quite high relative to me or perhaps, perhaps better to say I'm sailing very low of the rum line now. Um, and this is what I was hoping. I was hoping that you know, Keith would be a little distracted by the guys behind. Perhaps psychologically you know, he's had one person sail over the top, which was me, um, and that's making him feel a little bit uh, under the pressure, under the cosh, and he's now trying to defend his position from those behind, who he knows are light, light sailors and quick sailors like Phil Pachillo. So, 
it's a difficult position for him, and he's been so, sort of sucked into, into going higher. That's great news for me because they're all now tussling out and sailing a little higher. I've broken low, and I'm probably now clear of the boats behind in terms of their wind shadow. Um, so I'm going to be sailing pretty fast now, and I should be in a good position to round the mark in a good position. And there's a little bit more pressure coming now. You can see the, the sort of darker water um, and the little white horses. And I'm taking this pressure really low as I really seek to break away from the fleet. And you can watch my upper body there as I use my, my sort of transfer the weight across the boat to just try and keep it really, I would say I'm not going to on a knife edge, but just keep the boat going as fast as it can. Uh, keep it flying downwind in this pressure. And take the pressure low whenever I can. There's nobody sort of, uh, I've got nobody shadowing me at the moment. There's nobody there who's blocking my wind, so I've got clear wind. I've got to take full advantage of that. Um, because on a downwind leg, really, the advantage is to the boats behind. So I'll do well if I can get to this mark ahead of those boats. And you can just spot me shooting in there. And you'll see me shooting in again now as having made that low course, I'm now able to start heading up and keeping my speed high as I approach the mark. And you'll probably see me again in a minute, altering course again. So when I do that, you'll spot me just, just there I go, very delicate. I just sort of encourage the boat to roll slightly to leeward, which caused the boat to head up and I shoot it in. So I've kept my speed on and I'm now sailing in on that, on that low course that we looked at earlier. And I come in, I've got right to the mark, clear of everybody, I've gained a place, and I'm uh, perhaps also importantly, I'm now free to sail the rum line to the next mark if I wish to. Okay, so let's pause and reflect for a sec. So I've made a, some good gains on that downwind leg by going low. Keith, who ended up being sort of lulled into going high, has made some, some big losses. He's gone back to about fifth position. Um, don't worry, Keith, you're going to come back to a very respectable third by the end of the race. Um, Jeremy, who also opted to sell low, has made large gains too. He's now up into third. But as he goes around this mark, you can probably see that it's a, it's a full body jibe he commits to, and he ends up coming out of it sailing pretty high. And there's some logic to that. If you've got boats behind you, you might look to pinch a wind. But because I've got this separation now, I'm able to sail the rum, the rum line. The angle at which I'm sailing at is much lower again. I'm saying the shortest route to the mark at this point, and that's going to be quick. Okay, so if we pause it again, it's interesting to observe that um, a really fast off-wind sailor, and that's Phil Pachullo in the green laser, um, is determined to not get sort of pulled up to windward by the competition around him. Uh, he wants to break low. And that's what he's going to do on this leg. Um, now I'm in a slightly difficult position where I've actually got to also try and catch the guy in front who I've been making gains on. And eventually the danger I'm going to have is I'm going to have the opportunity to try and sail over the top of him. But let's see how Phil gets on. Now the problem with sailing that last leg so well is that it's pulled me up uh, um, a bit closer to the guy in front. And this is a bit of a problem for me because with a starboard round in here, I've got the opportunity to try and uh, get, on his, um, get on his stern and then perhaps try and get an overlap and get inside right and overtake him at the mark. Uh, now really I think in all honesty, I was probably never going to be able to do this. And so I'm going to get drawn into a private battle now, um, which is only going to cause me trouble because I'm going to lose a lot of time on the brakes behind uh, and I'm not going, to get, not, going to, not going to achieve what I set out to achieve. Um, now Phil Pachillo, who is the guy who's gone very low, and look how low he is now compared to me, and look how high I'm sailing compared, compared to the run line. This is just extra distance, 
and uh, it's going to mean I end up sailing into the mark eventually on a very uh, on a run, which is going to be very slow. So it's a really poor piece of decision making by me here. Um, and you're going to see in a minute the enormous gains that, because he's gone low, that Phil's going to have made, not just with respect to me, but also with respect to the, the, the guys he was sailing with at the second mark. And you can start to see this now, that Phil has broken well clear of the boats behind him. An excellent piece of sailing by him. And he's, he's uh, closed the gap up on me. I'm still foolishly sort of sailing too high uh, here. And Phil is, is going nice and low, taking that pressure that he's got, that I haven't got low. And you can see the gains he's making here, as I eventually have to give up, ease my sheet, and come in, come in very, I'm very, now saying on a very broad angle, pretty slow into the mark. And I uh, have to make my mark rounder. There I go. And round the mark I go, try and duck under the flag the best I can. So by having the courage to sail low, um, Phil has made really big gains, and I've been drawn into a into a bit of a, a competition, uh, and I've made I've made losses relative to Phil for sure. Now let's take a look at the strategy now for going upwind. Well, you know we're going around the third mark now, and we're going to beat back through the gate and up to the line. And in doing so, I really want to try and stay clear of that red zone, and that's the um, the area that's in the lee from the north uh, of, of, of a large, relatively large hill and of, and of the land. So I'm going to attack pretty quickly and let's see if that pays off. So given those strategic considerations, I'm going to opt to attack nice and quickly. That's going to keep me out of that um, red zone, the area of low pressure or, or, or less pressure um, to the south of that large hill. And also because this is a port tack, long leg to the, uh, the line, it's better to sail the long tack first, tactically. So I'm just trimming now, so a bit of out all along, and a bit of coming along, because I think there's quite a bit of pressure down here. Uh, and I'm, so I'm sort of making sure now that um, I keep the boat flat, with plenty of uh, trimming of the main sheet in and out is necessary to keep the boat flat. Remember, don't cleat that main sheet. That's what your arms are for. But once I'm through that bit of pressure, I sense that um, the wind is easing again. So you, know, you should start to see me now looking to um, change the balance of power again so I use the kicker and I ease off the Cunningham. Interesting when I do that there's a lot more power in the rig again and actually I'm having to ease the sheet to deal with the fact that there's now more power in the rig. So it's a difficult balance. The early tack seems to have uh, paid dividends for me and I'm just going to get headed slightly here with this bit of pressure and that means that both Alistair and myself are going to be headed and so I'm going to take the chance. Uh, I think I can cross him so uh, I'm going to take the chance to sort of crystallise those gains by tacking. A bit of communication with him as he asks what he wants me to do, and I'll tell him that he needs to duck behind me, which he does. And I'm in the lead. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up here, and uh, it's a bit of a high point for me as I, as I temporarily take the lead. Um, worth going back and actually re rewinding this and taking a look at Alistair's uh, technique as he, as he uh, bears away behind my stern and ducks me. Great piece of boat handling as he uh, eases the sheet and accelerates and then um, works the sheet back in nice and quickly and nice and aggressively and he sends a pretty strong message to me uh, which is all right sunshine you've crossed me here but I'm coming back for you and indeed 30 seconds later he crosses my bow uh, as I get the shift wrong and we go on to have a really really great tussle from from there. So as ever on these videos time's against us and uh, I really hope you've enjoyed this uh, this one There'll be more coming up soon. Have a great uh, sailing season 2013. See you on the water.